The Davenport House is one of the most significant houses in Savannah's history. It's the work of Isaiah Davenport, a builder from Rhode Island who came to Savannah and represented older building traditions that came out of England, the Georgian, or in America called the Federal Style Tradition, which is essentially a very conservative one by the 18 teens and 20s when he was practicing here in Savannah. The location of the Davenport House is really interesting. It stands in Columbia Ward facing Columbia Square from the east end of its tithing block. Now Columbia Ward is one of those 1790s expansion wards built just outside of the original six ward town of Savannah. So why is this interesting? Well, Davenport was a builder who was looking to attract the attention of clients, wealthy clients who most likely were based in the original part of the town or the closer to Bull Street. And yet his house borders the lower income, more modest area of the city to the east, where you'd have mostly smaller wooden houses. So this site represents a kind of transition zone and gives his house great prominence for prospective clients, and yet also marks the transition from the more substantial architecture in the middle of downtown to the more modest and affordable wooden housing to the east. Davenport House is a textbook example of what we call federal style architecture, which is the American equivalent of Georgian style architecture from England. And it's marked by a strong emphasis on symmetry, on classical proportion, and is typical in the United States of having red brick buildings with side gabled roof, uh, meaning the roof slopes down towards the front and back towards a peak and from the sides would look like a triangle. And from here we can see the classic profile of a federal style house with its side gable and chimneys and arched window up there in the attic that we'll see at the end of our tour. This is what we call a five bay house. So the center bay, the, it breaks up into five units. It's the center bay in the middle with two bays to the left and two bays to the right. And each of those represents a bay. And so this is a five bay house and it is almost perfectly symmetrical. And something that I didn't notice for a long time of coming to visit it is that the shutters on the right, if you look at the pairs of windows on the right, the windows are slightly, there's like a three inch gap between them, whereas the windows on the left have the shutters actually overlapping. And that the center hall is slightly off center. And the room on the right, as we go in, the front parlor is wider and larger than the room on the left. So if it weren't for the shutters, you would never notice that this house is slightly asymmetrical. Double hung sash windows, meaning the two sashes, in this case, six panes of glass in the upper sash over six panes of glass in the lower sash are very typical. Six over six windows of this style. And the central door, on that elevated main floor, first floor, has the rectangular side lights or side windows and an oval fan light above the door that is classic federal style. Above in the roof area on the third floor are the dormer windows of the sleeping quarters of the enslaved people who would have lived and worked in this building for the Davenports. It is an early example in Savannah of an elevated basement meaning that what you'd be inclined to call the ground floor, but in Savannah is known as a basement, but it's elevated above grade. And let's go a little closer and we'll look at some of the details. But greeting us at the front door is this uh, symmetrical staircase with two flights. And this would principally be for symmetry. There are all sorts of urban legends that one side's for women, one side's for men. And I think that's less likely than it's just a matter of the importance of symmetry. It is a wrought iron railing, meaning every piece of that metalwork was worked by a blacksmith, including the spectacular ironwork in the middle with its little curly cues and floral motif in the middle. As we get closer, we can see that the ironwork includes these little upside down heart shapes and a um, detail that I'll demonstrate in just a second. Built-in details of the railing at the, own, at the Davenport House are these boot scrapers, which are on both sides. And as you came up from the dirt streets 
you could literally scrape the mud off of your shoes before ascending into the house. For the construction of his house, Isaiah Davenport chose to use imported hard-pressed red bricks from up north, from New England. He was a builder from Rhode Island, so this would have been familiar. And these bricks are much smaller than the local Savannah Gray bricks, which are larger, softer, and less durable. You can see that these bricks are only about nine inches long and maybe barely two inches tall. And he's laid them in a common bond, meaning a row of stretchers that extend in and bond to the next row or Y the bricks in behind, and then five rows of stretchers. This is called the common or American bond and was a durable, but not as elaborate a bond as some others that you can see in Savannah. A nice detail on the Davenport, probably a later addition because it's cast iron, is this uh, dolphin face or fish face uh, attached to the bottom of the downspout and then it drains into a sandstone uh, stone that is set within this flagstone sidewalk. A sidewalk like this would have probably been original to the house and was a mark of stature that if you could afford it you would pay for a stone sidewalk at a time when wooden sidewalks were much more common. Immediately to the east of the Davenport House across Habersham Street is another early 19th century federal style house also with an elevated basement and side gable profile and tall prominent chimneys, 606 windows with the shutters, except it's made of wood. It has broad clabbered uh, siding and a wood frame house like that was much more typical of the kind of houses that would have been in this area, whereas the Davenport house with its brick construction was a kind of luxury expression, a kind of standard of wealth, and obviously a little bit more fireproof. But wooden houses predominate in the eastern, in these eastern expansion parts of downtown Savannah. Well, welcome inside the Davenport house. If we were doing a normal tour with all of you with me, we would enter through the gift shop door in what is the raised basement. So we've just come in from Habersham Street. We've already looked at the exterior and we're gonna come through the gift shop. Where we are is in the former basement area where the servants or slaves would have cooked, where they would have um, maintained the household. And if we look up, we can see the original heart pine uh, ceiling joists. The ceiling of the raised basement. We can see these massive 3 by 10 or 3 by 12 uh, rafters, huge pieces of lumber that hold up this house. This house which is built like a tank. Now off to the right we have here the original fireplace from when this was a kitchen and slaves would have served down here and cooked the meals for the family. As we move into the house, we are now, we're still in the raised basement, an area that in the future the Davenport House will reinterpret. So currently they have their uh, museum offices down here and the gift shop, and all of this will move to the candy pharmacy in behind the house in the near future. And as we climb the stairs, we'll be able to see the mortise and tenon construction. The various beams that hold up the floor of the first floor above are anchored together with a mortise, which is the hole basically, and a tenon, which is like, it gets this word from a tongue, and it's essentially joinery. So instead of using nails to hold the wood together in this building, they use mortise and tenon. As we climb the stairs, we can see the mortise and tenon joinery, where these squares correspond to the floor joists below, and you can see how that tenon, the tongue, goes through the hole, the mortise, and then they are, um, there's a peg would be inserted to keep them from moving. So as we come up the stairs, we enter the center hall of this house. This is not how you would originally historically have entered the house. We'd enter from the front door over there. The Davenport House is a very typical federal style grander home that has a center hall plan, meaning the hallway runs down the middle of the building and there are rooms on either side of this hall. 
As a visitor to the Davenport House, you would have come up the stairs on the outside to this door and entered this entry space, which is the public entry space is defined by the pair of columns behind me. Beyond the pair of columns would be the private realm of the house where you can see the stair, and we'll go investigate that in a few minutes. But first, let's enter into Davenport. Imagine we're doing a business relationship with Davenport, and we would meet him in his office, in this room off to the left. So Davenport's office is a, essentially a square room. There's a fireplace on the west wall, and pairs of windows on the west and south walls provide ample light to the space. His desk, where he would meet clients, is in the middle of the room. And we can see one of the most, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, shocking aspects of it when we look at it is the wallpaper, which is a his, which is based on historical patterns from 200 years ago. The house is, was built 200 years eight, around 1820, and this is a valid pattern that would have been available from cities like Philadelphia and New York. And the paper was not put on in rolls as we might today, but in blocks. So if we take a look at the wall here and see the reflection hitting the wallpaper on the wall. You just might be able to make out a joint right here and another joint there. The paper is laid in bricks, essentially, like a brick wall with the squares um, overlapping with each other. Up above is a cornice, and that cornice uses typical classical features of the Greek Revival era and federal style. So just to be clear, the federal style was popular from the late 18th century into the early 19th century, and the Davenport House is essentially a late example of the federal style and was overlapping with this newer style, the Greek Revival, and that key effect. The, it looks like a swirl, but it's angular and square, also very visible with the medallion in the middle, and you may notice that the medallion is quite crisp in its detail. And that's because the medallion is a recreation. It doesn't have 20 coats of paint on it. So that's what the molding, the cornice molding around the edge would have looked like originally. We can see acanthus leaves, a kind of Greek plant around the outer, then a bead motif, and then the Greek key, that zigzagging angular motif. Now compare that to the molding around the perimeter of the room, and it's just not as crisp. So as we zoom back out, we can uh, see these windows. Interesting fun fact is that the Venetian blinds that you can see on these windows are actually accurate to the time. Venetian blinds have existed since before the Davenport House uh, uh, was built. And you might ask, how do we know what was in this room? How do we know there were Venetian blinds? And that's because uh, there was an inventory at the time of Davenport's death, later in the 1820s, he died of yellow fever. And, the, and when someone died, they had to do an inventory of his estate. And so we know that the windows had Venetian blinds. So just like we have today, this is a really old light controlling technology. Now between the west windows, we can see this glorious marble mantle, and it would have been imported mantle from probably from Italy or England, and it is typical of the classical style of mantles of the day. Now in front of that fireplace, we have the desk where uh, Davenport would have met his clients, and they've got this interpreted so that you can see the um, kind of things that Davenport would have used, including a pen set in that little box uh, with a stylus and ink. And this book over here is a typical book of how Davenport, as a master builder, he wasn't an architect, he was a master builder, how did he learn his craft? Well, he 
use books like this, which are known as pattern books. A famous one, this one's called America's Builder's Companion by Asher Benjamin. And this would have been essentially like a design magazine of the time. And that they would have used, builders would have used this to understand what is the, the appropriate and accurate way to design, in this case, the Ionic order with its column, base, capital, um, and the entablature above it. Very typical of the time is to have doors made out of one material, but effectively stained or painted, a kind of faux finish that makes the material look richer than it really is. These doors are made of pine, but they're painted to resemble mahogany and a kind of burled maple, much richer materials. As rich as those materials are though, having a faux finished door was actually more valuable and considered even higher kind of um, form of ornament than the actual material. So in other words, a faux finished door was worth more than an actual mahogany and maple door. As we depart Davenport's office, we go out into the center hall and on the floor we see what's called a floor cloth. This is a piece of canvas painted and then shellacked to look like a marble inlay floor. The beauty of a floor cloth is that it could be taken up, it could be washed, if it wears out they could lay a new one, you could change the patterns as time goes on. And so this floor cloth extends the full length of the, of the center hall and you can see it has a kind of shiny sheen from the varnish, but it also reveals how it reflects the floorboards underneath. How over time, that's reflected. Now, once again, from the center hall, we see this pair of columns that defines the public from the private realm. So at this point, we're going to stay in the public realm and move across the hall to the front parlor. Let's enter the front parlor. This would have been the principal social space of any uh, upper middle class or upper class household in early 19th century America. Davenport was a builder, but his clientele were extremely wealthy people and he used his house as a kind of portfolio piece. So even though he socially didn't really belong to this class, he had to basically depict how he, he could build for them. So his own house is really grand, and it has a spectacular uh, faux silk wallpaper that was inspired by Napoleon in the early 19th century. And this parlor, as we see as we walk in, has, is, it's like a showcase of, of Davenport's design and especially his carpentry and building skills. So as we look around, we can see these blind arches. They're non-structural arches at the end of each room. So we have at the north and south end of the room are these broad uh, segmental arches carried by ionic columns that are purely decorative, but also show that these are purely decorative and show the uh, capability of him. We also notice that the window frames and door frames in this space are grander in detail. The cornice, the cornice of above is even more elaborate than the um, cornice in his office. And the, a further sign of this sort of social hierarchy of this room is if you look at the fireplace, we come down and look at the fireplace, we can see this one's even grander. It's taller, it's wider and particularly the use of a wide variety of materials, we can see, for example, a black marble, this mottled reddish marble, there's a white marble, and then a pure, uh, simpler black marble. So four, and then the hearth is a fifth color of marble. So at least five different kinds of marble. Now it's important to remember these fireplaces would have been used for burning wood. And this is important to note because when we go to the Owens Thomas house, those fireplaces burned coal. But very typical of the era, wood was the fuel supply. So this room, as I mentioned, was the principal social room of the Davenport house. And 
How did they use it? Well, you could have, uh, right now, all the furniture is pushed around the edges. They could have had a dance. You can see there's a violin in the corner here, and music, and a flute, that they, that you would have musical performances. You would have socials, uh, social gatherings. You could also set up a grand dining room table in this space, if you so wish. So it was a multi-purpose, but principally social room. It's called a parlor, the, and in some houses they had a front and back parlor, but this is the largest room in the house. It is the parlor, and it, uh, the ornament of the space from that blind arch and the columns to the frameworks and the scale of the medallion, which is purely decorative, there was never a, a chandelier coming from the ceiling, that this space was designed to reflect, it's dressed up, it's designed to reflect its social station. So if we think of the ornament of the room as clothing, we can think of this room as being in its best formal attire. Just beyond the parlor is a uh, subordinate space that was used mainly by the family, by Sarah Davenport, the uh, Isaiah Davenport's wife, and ultimately, pretty early on, his widow. They had multiple children, and it's here that she trained the children, she homeschooled them, she did her correspondence. And, but we can see, although the wallpaper indicates that this was a kind of expansion space, if the entertaining needed extra space, these big doors could open up and you could flow in here. But as you look carefully, you can see that the mantle is a simple wooden mantle, the door frame, the window frames are very simple, as is the cornice. We're back in the center hall, and we're going to pass now from the public realm of the office and the parlor into the private realm. And the columns represented a kind of screen, a, a social boundary space that we uh, increasingly have lost a sense of in our private homes because these kind of boundaries, we live in a very casual world. But back in a more formal world, these boundaries were important to observe. So we're going to pass by the columns and hang a left here. And come into the family uh, dining room. So the family dining room is uh, not as bright as the other rooms. It's got a north and west exposure with the windows. But once again, it has this fabulous wallpaper that is actually quite remarkable. and seemingly more modernistic, but it is accurate to the time from about 200 years ago. And we can see as, if, as, as we come into the space that this is a dining room that would have been used, they would have their principal meal during the heat of the day. They would eat typically their biggest meal uh, around 2 or 3 in the afternoon. And we can see that this space is uh, what you might call more business casual. Uh, it is dressed up only to a point. The mantle, like across the hall, is a wooden, simple wooden mantle. The cornices are relatively simple. As we see, it just, it's, uh, the moldings, the cornices, I should add, are a combination of plaster and horsehair. And they would have been molded, they could be molded ahead of time and then inserted in place. It's a very typical way that cornices are made. And we can see the furniture uh, provides the cabinetry for the dishes and the dining room set. One of the distinctive things about this room, the family dining room at the back northwest corner of the house, is all the trim is painted this kind of green color. And there was a belief at the time that the green might help deter insects. Also, paint at the time often incorporated arsenic into the paint, which likewise was believed to help deter insects. Because it's important to remember, one thing we take for granted on our windows today that they did not have at the time were screens. Screens came much later, I believe in the early 20th century. So if they opened the windows, insects would have been able to come in. If we zoom in, we can see this lovely wallpaper with these swirl patterns of mauve and orange um, branches in between them. Again, laid out in blocks, not in rolls. At the back of the center hall 
is the staircase that rises up through the house and is visible from the front door beyond the columns that you can just see at the edge of the frame and is really the masterpiece, masterwork of the interior of the Davenport house. And as we look up, we can see this staircase rises up. We have a window at the back of the hall and it all rotates so you can, this will all fit in frame. And you get this spectacular view up through the different levels of the staircase. At the rear end of the center hall is the grand stair, and we're going to go up it in just a moment. But just as a sign of how well built this house is, Davenport was a master builder, and he put this back door at the far end of the center hall. And you can see as it opens, it goes glancing by the underside of the staircase, but it doesn't touch it. In other words, this house has not settled at all. The staircase comprises a newel post and a railing and balusters. And although it looks fragile, it's actually incredibly strong. So as we come in close, we can see that the newel post actually has a little cap here. And there's a threaded bolt, so you can literally tighten the newel post. And the balusters, you can hear, are wood until you hit this one. This one is metal, and if you were here, you'd be able to feel how this one is cold to the touch, and these ones are wood, that one's metal, wood, 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 all the way up to this one's metal. So about every tenth baluster is metal to help reinforce the railing. As we climb the stairs at the back of the center hall and rise up to the second floor, we can see the details on the edge of the step, a classical, uh, typical classical detail. Once again, the uh, balusters alternating uh, wood. At this point, mostly wood, but once again, we have a metal one right here. And the staircase leads us up to the second floor, which is the private realm of the bedrooms. And here is the center hall on the second floor giving access to the four original bedrooms. The wallpaper all through the center hall on both the first and second floors and rises up to the third floor is this specific wallpaper, which actually is a relatively recent addition to the Davenport House Museum. A house about a block away on Broughton Street at Habersham is called the Barian House, the John Barian House, which has recently been restored. And in the process of excavating through the walls of that building, they found vestiges of this pattern of wallpaper. Now, the Barian House is slightly older than the Davenport House. And as far as I know, the Barian House is the only surviving location, the only surviving example of this specific pattern, which is uh, ribbons that are coiled around to form a kind of trellis motif. So these are bands of ribbon, and then we have these little roundels and a little uh, foliage-like motif. So a trellis of ribbon wound together, and so this is known as the, uh, Bar the, the Barian House wallpaper. In the center hall on second floor is a door that illustrates this idea of preservation but also sort of pulls back the curtain on what they've discovered. So we're just talking about the wallpaper. Well, here's one of those faux finished doors, a pine door, and it's kind of hard to see, but there's actually layers of paint on this side. And then this one's been taken back through the many layers. So this one has the faux finish on top of layers of historic, of historic paint. So the doors might've been changed in color over time. But how do they know this is what the door originally looked like? Well, they excavated through all the layers of paint and they came down to this, this layer. This is the bottom layer that reveals the original finish on the door. So this one they've left essentially unrestored so that we have a clue as to how the doors originally looked. One of the daughter's bedrooms. And we can see immediately that the architecture of these spaces upstairs especially this bedroom, is quite plain compared to the public spaces below. And so as we come in, we can see a bed with um, draping on it to help prevent mosquitoes. 
and the bed is quite high. And in fact, you would, uh, one of the reasons for having a high bed was in the winter that got you away from the drafts. And another thing we see is the facility, the chamber pot. So whether in the middle of the night or in the morning, you had to relieve yourself, you would use the chamber pot. And of course, they had enslaved help whose responsibility it was to clean out those. And then you take those out in, someone in the household would take those out, and there'd be someone in the city whose job it was, if you can imagine, to collect the excrement from every household. And you drive a truck or a cart around collecting uh, everyone's effluence, everyone's poop and pee, and uh, I can't imagine what that job was like, but that's what they needed because in 1820, no city had a sewer system and no modern city had sewers. The streets were dirt, there were no sewers, there was no water supply, there was no indoor plumbing, with the exception of the Owens Thomas House. But without a sewer system, you had to get, dispose of the waste somehow. So chamber pots collected and disposed each day with someone out in the city. So as we come into this room, we can see uh, relatively uh, you know, nice furnishings, but an even simpler fireplace. So let's go a little closer to that. The mantle here is made of wood with even fewer details than the mantles downstairs and a few portraits. The walls are rough, are relatively bare of ornament, of, of pictures. Today we have posters and paintings and all sorts of things we can hang on the wall, but that's why wallpaper was so important. Pattern wallpaper was so important because they didn't have those kind of pictures. Most people couldn't afford those kind of pictures. But what they, this family could afford are these silhouettes. And we can see a few silhouettes that were downstairs. And here's an example of one of the um, Davenport girls in a silhouette with her dog. So let's pass into the master bedroom of the Davenports, which you can immediately see is far grander than the bedroom we've just been visiting. And you might wonder, well, if bedrooms are private, why have all this ornament? So first of all, let's look at the ornament. So we can see that the windows and the mantle, so the mantle once again is wood, and, uh, but it has an extra ornament. It has a beaded recessed panel. It's a little taller and grander, has the suggestion of little colonnettes flanking the open area of the fireplace proper. And we have valences and drapes on the windows beyond the, in addition to the Venetian blinds. And of course we have this scenographic wallpaper that's very elaborate wallpaper, very French in character, uh, depicting pastoral scenes. But again, uh, something that gave uh, a sense of decoration to the space. This is the kind of bedroom and setting where after a birth, the mother would be expected to be visited. There'd be a little cradle here. And, but it's also a room that could be used on occasion if some member of the family was dying and members of the public or family would come to visit. So this room had to be dressed up a little bit in order to allow people for the visitors to, for the family to receive guests, be it times of births or sicknesses or death. They would lay a, a, passed away, a person who passed away on the bed and you could pay your respects. On the far side of the room, we can see there's a little space at the, in the center hall area. And one of the things you may have noticed as we've gone from room to room is that something's missing. Something we take for granted in our bedrooms today. In fact, uh, the bigger the better today, and that is closets. Now you might wonder, why didn't they have closets? Well, first of all, they didn't have as many clothes. They might have a Sunday best suit, and uh, relatively few sets of clothes, far fewer than we have today. They would have a dresser, they might have a wardrobe, an armoire, but uh, the clothes could be stored seasonally in what's called a trunk room. And the trunk room in this case is in the center hall area between the master bedroom and the boys' bedroom. 
Here we are in the boys' bedroom. So as we enter this space from the trunk room, or we could have come in through the hall, we can see relatively simple uh, appointment of the room with probably the most interesting piece is the bed. And how did people sleep back then? Well, a rope bed like this is not uh, unusual. And you would have a, a canvas, basically mat, tied in place with a rope, and you would tighten it. And the expression, sleep tight, comes from rope beds like this. So as the ropes slacken over time, this canvas sags, so we'd want a firmer support, you tighten the bed. A public tour would not be allowed normally to go upstairs. They have this little barrier here that prevents the public tours from going up to the third floor to see the very, very cool attic. So we're gonna head upstairs, follow me. Imagine being among the slaves who had to live up in the sleeping quarters up on this floor. It would have been definitely hotter, or in the winter, definitely colder. So follow me as we go into what many people can consider the coolest space of the, of the tour. So we're in the attic space. You can see that the boards are extremely wide pieces of, of lumber in this space. And the blue, we're not sure how old it is, but the blue is what we call haint blue. And this is an African tradition, a belief of the African slaves who brought here. They brought this belief with them that water keeps away evil spirits. So in this space, almost like a, uh, a boundary, they painted blue on the walls particularly and around the windows. I don't see any on the ceiling, but it's on the walls. And it would basically keep the evil spirits away for the enslaved people who lived up here. Come around here and we'll see this window uh, in the dormer, which we can see from outside. This is one of two sources of light. As we look at this dormer window, we can see the hand-blown glass, which hopefully we'll pick up in the camera. So I'll just move the camera up and down here, and you can see the wavy, hand-blown nature of the glass. These windows are roughly about nine inches by nine inches square, which is about as big a piece of glass as you could get around 1820. As we move through the decades, glass will get bigger and bigger and bigger. It was really a luxury product in the early 19th century, so you would use it sparingly and windows tended to be small. One thing that's very evident is there is no fireplace in this space. There is uh, the ventilation. The windows would have provided ventilation in the summer, but in the winter, it would have been very, very drafty. And so you can see cloth and bits of paper have been tacked on to the ceiling to try and provide a little bit of comfort. But these boards are so incredibly wide. Some of these boards are like 16, 18 inches wide, as are the floorboards. The floorboards are really wide. So once again, it's heart pine, but you wouldn't have used the top grade quality material in this space. The floors, just to give you a sense, I'll put my feet into the picture and you get a sense of just how wide these floorboards are and that this gives you a sense. This is lumber that's from old growth trees that would have uh, been harvested by Davenport, or at least he would have gone to a lumber yard, but they could cut down huge old trees and get these big, big boards. And that made it possible to have these kind of boards. In fact, the width of a floorboard or a board on a wall is a clue as to how old a building is, because 200 years ago, you could still get old growth lumber. As we move through the 19th century, the, pla the clapboards on the outside of a building go from being wide like these to progressively narrower, and we see the same thing with floorboards. And so this reflects a kind of evolution of the availability of lumber. So this concludes our tour of the Davenport House. We're gonna go back downstairs, and just thought I'd give you a view down over the railing here. 
and you can see this great view down to the first floor. Before leaving the Davenport House, it's important to remember the critical role it played in the development of the historic preservation movement here in Savannah. In 1955, the house was threatened with demolition to be replaced by a parking lot that would serve the funeral home that occupied the Kehoe House there on the left. Seven ladies came together to fight this demolition, raise the money, and buy the house. And in so doing, led to the establishment of the historic Savannah Foundation, whose headquarters are now directly across the square from the Davenport House. And that foundation has gone on to save hundreds of houses around the city of Savannah and fight for many preservation causes. So the Davenport House not only is significant as an example of the federal style, as the example of the builder tradition that came out of the 18th century, but also played a critical role in preservation here in Savannah.